Hi everyone and welcome, this is the Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a great day. If you are thinking of converting to Islam, then you may have heard a lot of things about Islam. If people want you to convert to Islam, they will only praise Islam. Because Muslims do not only have to believe in Islam, it is also their obligation to convert others. They will not accept that something about Islam could be wrong or bad, and they will react very strongly to criticism and to critics, especially to ex-Muslims like myself. It would be unwise, however, to only listen to the advocates and not to the critics. Converting to Islam requires you to fundamentally change your life and the way you think. It will be a decision that is awfully hard to reverse, and even if you want to change your mind afterward, you will find yourself forced to justify your conversion and to stay loyal to your decision. So, before you buy this product based on the good reviews, let me tell you about why I returned this product called Islam. I have talked a lot about what is wrong with Islamic theology and scripture. Today I want to talk about the main figure of Islam, Muhammad. Talking about Muhammad and reviewing him before joining or leaving Islam is so important because it is a core teaching in Islam that Muhammad is Allah's final and perfect messenger. It is required to believe in Allah and in Muhammad, to revere Muhammad and respect him, to obey him to praise him when he's mentioned, and to love him more than anyone else. He is taught to be the perfect example for all humankind. Everything he did is good, and he must be followed and imitated. But where do we get this idea that Muhammad is perfect, the final messenger of Allah, and that he needs to be obeyed from? Primarily, Muslims get it from the Quran, the holy book of Islam. But why would we listen to the Quran? It is believed that the Quran was revealed to Muhammad through an angel, and Muhammad then recited those revelations over a span of 23 years to multiple people in his surrounding who memorized or took notes of those revelations. After Muhammad died, and many of those memorizers and scribes died too, his successors came up with the idea to compile all the remaining memories and notes and make it one book, which became the first Quran. And we know that all of this happened because we are told so in orally transmitted reports known as the Hadith, which were compiled in books known as the Hadith books generations after Muhammad. So, in short, we have these Hadith books whose authors tell us that person A said, that person B said, that person C said, that person D said, that person E said, that he went around to collect Quran verses, from the minds and notes of many other people from the alphabet who listened to Muhammad who recited those verses to them. Oh, and of course, E collected all the right verses from these minds and notes, and together with person F and person G, then accurately compiled the entire Quran and turned it into the book that we have today. And we are to trust all of that. All of this already calls into question the entire reliability and authenticity of the Quran and Islam. But if we did assume, for the sake of the argument, that all of this is indeed true and that everything went right in this process, then we have one more problem. Muhammad recited these verses, these revelations, over 20 years to his people after he supposedly received revelations through an angel which only appeared to him. But how exactly can we trust him? All we have is a man who tells us to obey a book which he himself claims to him was inspired to him by God. So, Muhammad tells us to obey the Quran, which tells us to obey Muhammad, who tells us to obey the Quran, which tells us to obey Muhammad, who tells us to obey the Quran, and so on. How do we know that we can trust Muhammad in all of this? If we look at Islamic traditions, we see that Muhammad used to hang out in a cave near Mecca, where he also received his first revelation. As reported, a giant, terrifying figure, the angel Gabriel, came to him and started giving the revelations to him. And he was very scared, he didn't know what was going on. He went home to his wife Khadija. It is said that her cousin Waraka, who converted to Christianity and who was studying the Bible, then told Muhammad that he must be inspired by God, and that this terrifying figure must be God's angel. Of course, that is what we know from reports, or from Muhammad himself. Neither this first inspiration nor this conversation can be documented. And we also don't know what Muhammad actually saw. 
we understand that Muhammad wanted to keep receiving these revelations, and he considered himself a messenger. When he wouldn't get these revelations, he would become extremely destructively depressed. According to some reports, he wanted to commit suicide and throw himself off a mountain. In other reports, once the angel did not appear to him, and he was very frustrated, and later that day he explained that the angel did not come to him because there was a dog in his house, and he then wanted the dog and all dogs in the city to be removed, and ordered dogs to be killed, which his followers followed. Muhammad was also not the best example. The Quran does make a rule that his followers, the Muslims, can marry up to four wives, but Muhammad himself had a dozen wives. For no reason, he didn't have to marry those people. He did permit his loyal followers to lie in order to deceive and kill one of his opponents who spoke ill of Muhammad, or who incited others to hate and oppose Muhammad. The supposed miracles that Muhammad performed in order to verify his prophethood are majorly two miracles, the splitting of the moon in his time and that he rode on the back of a horse-like animal to Jerusalem and then to heaven and back. For the moon splitting, we have absolutely no evidence from anywhere in the world, which already kind of discredits Islam's claim. And the other miracle, where he rode on the back of a horse to the sky, is also unproven because it reportedly happened while he was asleep, in his bed. In scientific terms, we call that dreaming. Muhammad kept claiming that the end was near. He claimed that a child in his company would not grow old until the last hour would come. According to another report, he thought that an individual in his presence was the Dajjal, the Islamic equivalent of the Antichrist, who was expected to come before the end of the world. If Muhammad himself, who was supposedly constantly inspired and guided by Allah, said that, and he was clearly wrong about it, then how can we trust anything that he said? He married a child when she was six and had sex with her when she was nine. This is extremely hard to justify, I imagine, if you have not yet converted to Islam. The center of worship that he prayed towards, the Kaaba, which also all Muslims in the world pray toward, was a pre-Islamic pagan temple with no connection whatsoever to Abrahamic monotheism, no matter how much Islam tries to make that connection. It is no surprise that even according to the Quran's own admission and angry responses, people, polytheists in Muhammad's surroundings, accused him of lying and of making up things as he goes, of contradicting himself and replacing Quran verses. Just because some people did believe in him due to political power and alliances, and maybe because his message was quite enticing for that 7th century region, we cannot simply accept him as a truthful prophet. No one has ever witnessed Muhammad's interactions with the angel and with Allah. All that we know is that Muhammad claimed to be inspired, and these revelations and inspirations seemingly came as needed. If we trust him, why do we not trust many other self-proclaimed prophets who make similar prophecies and claims, without any proof whatsoever? But as said, until we even get to Muhammad, we first have to trust that his successors actually did everything right, and that is highly dubious. I'm only scratching the surface here. I have gone into detail very much before, and I will keep doing so in the future. If you are seriously thinking of converting to Islam, then I recommend not only listening to those who want you to join, but I beseech you to also listen to those who have left Islam and those who criticize Islam. Also, leaving Islam carries the death penalty as Muhammad commanded it, so joining it and leaving it willingly is probably not a very pleasant idea. Thanks for listening. I have mostly focused on analyzing Muhammad and his reliability. If you want to learn more about the Quran's authenticity and the history of the Quran's preservation, please go and watch Islam Critique's video on this matter. I will link it here in the description and in the pinned comment. I will be back. Have a great day and stay away from Islam.